Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 722. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is March 8th, 2022. All right, viewers, welcome to another program. We've been fi fixing all our digital stuff here. About two minutes ago, I was completely blue. I looked like a Smurf on camera. I think we got that fixed. George is looking good. The sound is good. We're ready for a great show. We took the week off so George could get his mortgage. George, have you moved into the new house yet? We moved in four and a half, five years ago. Uh, <laughs> but do we own it yet? No. We were to go to settlement on uh, the first of the month, this month. And the mortgage company has not yet finished looking at the paperwork and going ooh and ah. And it's just been pushed off. And hopefully we'll have settlement this Friday. But every time we're ready to get the closing document, Florida requires three days between the closing document and the actual settlement, they'll come back and say, hmm, why didn't you pay that Sports Illustrated subscription in 1978 when you got yes. that free tote bag? Did Maybe you sign your draft card? Did you, did you sign your draft card back in the eighties? Yeah, all the questions. I, actually, actually, if that were the issue, that's great, <laughs> Kevin. Yes, I have reached the heights of American middle class bourgeois respectability. Wait a minute, I have you, have, at, you, you have a parking spot at Wendy's? What? No, no, no. Even more profound than that, I have been asked to serve on the county draft board. What? Select. <laughs> Select. You may have thought that when the Vietnam War ended, select uh, the draft ended, but the selective service system continues. Hmm. And uh, when we were eighteen, you had to do it. I had to do it. I, I, yeah, register absolutely. for the draft. Yeah. And throughout the United States, the selective service system has skeleton draft boards for each county in the United States, so that in case of World War Three. Hello, Joe Biden. Uh, we can have a rollout of the draft, and for some reason, maybe it's because I am such a such a pompous ass. They thought I'd be wonderful on the draft board. Jeez, I think I've aged out. I'm too old, right? I, I got to be too old to be drafted. Yeah. It's, well, Kevin. Yeah. Kevin, I'm sorry. I just can't wait to say sorry, son. You're going to Vietnam. You're going to Vietnam. <laughs> oh, oh I'm. I'm big. <laughs> no, it's 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 true. It's the the uh, it's the appointments made by the governor of the state upon the recommendation of county officials and mm -hmm. my cultivating the local sheriff all these years, um, uh, and the local, you know just being part of the community here. Uh, they needed somebody to do a job that uh, it doesn't pay anything purely voluntary. But we're but I just think it's funny, not haha -ha funny, but ironic funny. Sure that we're talking about selective service as the world edges closer to thermonuclear war. Well, here we are. Uh, we, As we were recording a week ago, uh, war was just breaking out. Uh, Russia had invaded Ukraine. We commented on a little. We took all last week off so that you could move into your house, which you didn't move into. You could get the mortgage, which you didn't get yet. Um, none of that happened. And I guess people have just been waiting for what are Kevin and George going to say about the, the war in Russia and Ukraine. Words, wow, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, I thought, you know, we weren't going to do this anymore. I thought uh, Russia understood they weren't a superpower. or Putin would have understood he's not a superpower anymore. And we're just watching uh, the images come out of Ukraine. We're watching... Uh, a, the leader of Ukraine do a good job in defending his country but wow George uh, did you ever expect something like this to happen uh, in these times I'm not surprised it happened mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not hear me out folks for, for the two cranks who watch the show This the, I'm giving you a hint we're going to do it early in the show so you don't have to watch past this point to complain no. I can understand where Vladimir's coming from in Vladimir Putin's head. Oh, um, abso absolutely. Well, there, there, have been, he, there have been treaties that are signed. There mm -hmm. have been all this so that uh, Ukraine is to be uh, non-aligned. It's to be non-nuclear. Mm -hmm. February, you know, February 22nd of this year, Zelensky said, you know, Ukraine start 
going to start pursuing nuclear weapons. We want to join NATO. Mm -hmm. We're uh, uh, doing biological warfare experiments uh, in the we, eastern Ukraine. We want to be part of e, uh, EU. There's a whole bunch of stuff. That EU and NATO. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just put yourself in Putin's position. You may not want to. But it's the same mindset that John F. Kennedy had in the Bay of Pigs yeah. and in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah. Uh, Russia does not want someone who has told them, no, you can't be part of NATO. That was Russia asked to be part of NATO. Putin asked. They'd said no. Putin said, okay, we have these treaties about not being non-aligned, about there being a buffer zone. All of that's been broken. And now... Putin did what Putin felt he had to do. Yeah, and did I wanna, he do the right thing? I don't think so. Well, but no, he, I but can see where he's coming from. I, and here's what I wanted to do to the divide. You know, I don't want to use Russia here. I want to say this is Putin's decision. You know, Russia did not decide to invade uh, Ukraine. Putin thought he had no choice. He was left up against mm -hmm. the wall, and all the promises that were made to Putin were broken. And he's like, well, fine. I'm going to go into Ukraine. I had no trouble going into Korea. How hard could this be? What Putin didn't realize is Russia is no longer a superpower. The Russian tanks were built in the in the 60s, 70s, and a couple in, in like 82. These are old tanks. They take a lot of fuel. They, they were running out of fuel 15 miles into Ukraine. And the Ukrainians know, hey, all we got to do is blow up the gas uh, lines and take out the, the fuel trucks, and we got this made. And it, it, it was just, my biggest surprise was to learn that the Russian army does it use encrypted uh, communications. All their walkie-talkies and stuff can be picked up by your regular ham radio people and your regular CB people. And so everything these tank commanders were uh, calling back to get fuel was being heard by the, uh, the opposition, the defenses of Ukraine, and boom, look what's happened, George. It's crazy. Well, see, well, the thing is, I don't know if I believe it. Mm -hmm. There have been so many lies from both sides. Oh, yeah. Um, and there have been these generals who appear on TV as analysts. Remember, these are the guys who lost Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. These are the guys as junior officers lost Vietnam. They may have had a few good weeks with uh, in Iraq, but then we had 20 miserable years to follow. Uh, these guys have a wonderful track record of complete and utter failure. And then they're supported by cretinous politicians like Lindsey Graham, uh, the chicken hawk's chicken hawk, uh, who now is calling for the assassination of Putin. Now, you know, we need to have some adults in our government, Republicans or Democrats. That being said, um, Putin, only a thousand, according to the Ukrainians, a thousand civilians have died. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's about a year's gun, de gun deaths in Chicago. No, I'm not making light of that. If the Russians wanted to, we would have had tens of thousands of casualties. If the, the Russian desire is to win the hearts and minds of the Ukrainians and we're going slow, it is argued. In 1968, over a million troops went in to crush the Prague Spring. They had no problem telling the Czechs how to act and what to do and when to do it. Same with Hungary in 56, same with East Berlin in 53. Um, Putin, uh, this is so this is so complicated. There's no, there's some guys on TV who are painting Zelensky as another George Washington. Now we forget that Ukraine is one of the most corrupt nations in Europe, alongside with Russia. These are two bad governments, and I'm not talking about the people. No, no, I'm no. talking about the politicians. Politicians, absolutely. And the people, and all this and that, and. Then you work in uh, who who was on a retainer at eighty thousand a month uh, from the Ukrainian state gas company. Uh, somebody's the, son, I the forget. hunter, uh, the hunter guy. What's his? I forget his name. Paul Bunyan. No, uh, Hunter Paul. Biden. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All, now, now this in no way excuses what has happened, but I do think that we need just to slow down and not pretend to read minds. Some of the laziest, dumbest thinking is to call Putin a Hitler or call him crazy. That's just a lazy way of saying you have no clue what you're talking about. Well, Kevin um, and George, what are you talking about? Let's set this up by going back in time. I want to take this all the way back to the Kuwait War. 
when Saddam Hussein who'd Oh, I, I thought you wanted to go back to 812 and <laughs> no, the 812, Kiev and Rus. No. <laughs> that's 819. But in, instead of going back to Kiev, I want to go back to um, kind of the fog of war and putting out any story you want to put out. And mm -hmm. we heard about Saddam Hussein's troops going into Kuwait, going to the hospitals, and throwing the babies out of the incubators. The famous incubator mm -hmm. story. And the uh, Tes testimony before Congress. Yeah, to get testimony. Us all uh, Nahara, I forget her last name. I'm going to look it up right here. Uh, Saba was the uh, daughter of the ambassador uh, from America to Kuwait, or from Kuwait to America, got up and gave testimony before Congress and said, uh, she saw the soldiers going into the hospitals and throwing the babies out of the incubators and they were dying on the street. This is what caused George Herbert Walker, the first Bush, <laughs> to go to war. He said, we can't have this. This guy's a monster. We learn after the war that the story was completely made up. It was another Star Wars. It was another you know, way for us to be thrown into a war uh, with which we, we needed that righteousness to be on the right side of history to go into. And well, we spent 35 year, 30 years now in, in the Middle East trying to fight these wars, kind of sparked by this one testimony of how evil Sodom was and that got us in there. And we were stuck in the quagmire of the Middle East. In the same way, this, some of what you're seeing the, reported by the press here on the Ukrainian side is false. And I've seen some of these little testimonies going around by uh, Christians who are on, on the ground there that's a little bit conflated as to what's really happening on the ground. And, you know, that's just the, that's the art of the fog of war. You want to be sure your side has the, the empathy on it and the sympathy on it. The Ukrainian uh, leader Zelensky is an expert in the art of persuasion, a telegenic, attractive, persuasive man wrapping himself in the flag of nationalism and peace and all this and that. Good job. You've convinced a lot of people. But, there are no f but the actual facts, we don't know what's happening. And for us to basically s s have... I like the idea of a no-fly zone over Ukraine. The moment uh, an American aircraft or a German fighter or a Polish fighter shoots down a Russian air uh, aircraft, what do you think is going to happen? Hmm? The, why do you think oh, there are only about 150,000 troops, in my understanding, have moved it towards the main thrust? Where are the other two and a half million Russian troops? Um, why are they i mean are they all so terrible that they can only send these guys or well going back to my we, point this is still a 70s army yes uh you know they're, they're stuck in the the great thing about russia is it has a wonderful rail system they can deliver their army to any border they want within days the problem mm -hmm. is when they get into the country they're invading they get stuck in in the quagmire of that route system that road system and the supply lines break down so, yeah, if you're asking the but, question as, where's the other two million? Who knows? Well, I, I, my, my perspective, and again, I'm not talking about the morality of the Russians' actions, is, is that we do not know what the Russians' war aims are. Right. So, if there were, so us basically saying, oh, well, the Russians are failing, how do we know that? Mm -hmm. By what measure do we say? Um, you know, the Russians had no problem in Afghanistan when they were there, killing hundreds of thousands of civilians. Mm -hmm. Now they're trying to do their best to destroy public buildings and not kill civilians. Why is that? Um, the other thing I want to just mention, I do know a bit about this area, and once upon a time I was a... I covered the Second Lebanon War for the Jerusalem Post um, as a reporter. I was based in London at the time. And so I would write about defense policy and talk about these things with people, as well as doing confirmation class and Easter egg hunts and all this fun stuff. People like to talk about Russia. This is not Russia. It's the Russian Federation. Same difference, people would yeah, say. Yeah, same difference. Well, in 20, uh, 2017, a published report talked about the ethnicity of the Russian army. The majority of officers in the Russian army are ethnic Ukrainians. Only 28% of the Russian Federation's officer corps are Russians. 
the majority of the NCOs in the Russian army in 2017 were from the Caucasus. The professional military. Russia has a tradition, like in the United States. United States, a great number of professional soldiers have come from the, from the Old South. Russia, a great number of their officers come from the Ukraine. And when Ukraine split, in, you can still be Ukrainian and join the Russian army and make a career in the Russian army. Um, we, we need to understand this, that the, Rus the, Ukrainian, the Russians are not fighting the Germans where it's to death and we're not going to take any prisoners, whatever. They do look upon, and this is Kirill's point, Greater Rus. Kirill had a speech that, you know, may God protect Greater Rus, which he explained was Russia, Belarus, and the Ukraine. Different governments, different languages, but they're all the same people in the Orthodox Russian worldview, which is, for better or for worse, Vladimir Putin's worldview. So we're told. So it's just, I, I guess my impatience is these people who can tell us all the answers. I'm telling you folks, I don't know what's going on. I have no clue what's going to happen. I only know that what I see, I laugh at because I know it's not true. Well, we talked last time about whether Russia was still communist or it's capitalist. And it is a capitalist system run by former communists. Sure. It makes it a mess. It, it, it makes it a mess. But in the same respect, it's not completely capitalist because the fuel industry, the transportation industry, uh, and is all still run by the government. Uh, they, you know, your basic storefronts and stuff like that are uh, run by and owned by citizens of Russia, but the rest is owned by the government. And people talk about the oligarchs. These are the kind of the first capitalists that existed right after the breakup of the Soviet Union. They're the ones who started the stores and started, uh, you know, putting venture capital to work. And, uh, you know, one guy would fly to Europe and get all these old computers and bring them back to uh, uh, businesses and sell them. He'd buy them for 3000 in in London and sell them for 85000 uh in Russia. He was going to make some money, George. There, there's, there's there's good income there. And people, for, people forget that when... when uh when Putin was first elected in his first nine-year term, he followed Boris Yeltsin, who was an utter fiasco economically and this and that. And under, in his first night, in his first term, the gross domestic income, and the gross domestic product income rose 72%. The average wealth of Russian individuals rose 72%. And it basically was the understanding is that we're going to give you a trade-off. Uh, you will have a more prosperous, more comfortable life than you did under good old-fashioned communism. Communism will inject capitalist market forces and then we'll raise the boats for everybody. But just remember who brought you to the ball, who brought you to yes. the dance. Yeah. You give up your democratic rights, we'll go through the fiction, we'll do this and that. But in exchange for prosperity relative to what we had, this is what you need to give back to us, which is power. And that's what Mikhail Gorbachev knew about when he introduced Glasnost. You know, there's going to be trade-offs here. You know, and I think in the back of his not mind, Mikhail knew that the Soviet Union would crumble under Glasnost. You know, I think that he there was just this prediction that if I let this go a Yeltsin will step in and I'll have to flee the country. Yeah. I, I do want to point out though, I mean, I've refrained from putting every Tom, Dick and Harry statement about the wars up on Anglican Inc. Mm -hmm. um, the, the major players immediately all had their words out. But you know, at this stage, I just got a, the other day, a press release from the Anglican Church in New Zealand. They think this is bad. The Anglican Church of Canada, uh, Linda Nichols, the primate has a statement, it's terrible. At a certain point, you have to say, what does it matter that Linda Nichols says this is terrible? And then there's a tendency among some wings of the Anglican world to go into the Putin is crazy, Putin is a Hitler, he's a monster, and this and that. I would compare that to the Catholic approach and the approach taken by people like, as I perceive, by Foley Beach, mm -hmm. the ACNA, or Kanishka Rafael of the uh, 
Archdi of the Diocese of Sydney, where war is awful, yep. the suffering is awful, the hurt that has been caused is awful, but we're not going to call Vladimir Putin a Hitler. Um, we're basically going to basically focus on where we can see the most good through aid, relief, and support. Kirill, uh, or Cyril, the Patriarch of Moscow, had a meeting with the Catholic Church, and the Nuncio, and uh, some cardinals also went to the uh, Ukraine at the same time. And after the meeting, Kirill said, I'm very pleased that the Catholic Church's position in the Ukraine, in the war in Ukraine, is wise and, uh, what was it? Wise and cautious? Wise something and, like well, you know, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Uh, moderate and wise. Yeah. Same Moderate thing. and wise. <laughs> now, Justin Welby and Stephen uh, Cottrell came out with an over the top statement that was emotionally satisfying when the war began. Evil, horrible, wicked, this and that. But it was focused at a man and a country and a, and a regime. Francis is focusing on war is evil and wicked and suffering is evil and wicked. Kanishka Rafael and uh, Foley Beach are saying we need to pray for these people. We need to support them financially as we can. And there are still some grown-ups left in the room, in my opinion, in the Anglican world. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, uh, one of them is not the Archbishop of Canterbury. Well, there you we, we, we find ourselves in just just a mess. And we, we talked about this just over a week. Now, as a capitalist and understanding how things work in Russia, as far as the capitalism, I don't know if Russia, if Putin survives this. I, I, I wonder if the people who are have the money are making the money really support Putin or not. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if they successfully invade uh, Ukraine or not. Uh, well, he, I don't, he, I don't a, trust the press enough to know what's really happening. And here's the funny thing, like the, the our, our lords at uh, YouTube, for instance, and Facebook have shut down uh, RT, Rush, R, R, RT, Russian television. Right, yeah. You can't see what they're saying and thinking in their English language broadcasts. So in essence, we don't know their narrative. Now, if you can read Russian and you can look at the newspapers, the war is by and large popular, not because in a jingoistic way, but our backs were against the wall. We were forced into this. And well, we don't want war, but if we're going to have war, let's do it. Let's do it now. Get it over quick. Um, that's, that's what I'm reading in the Russian newspapers. Do I know that's true? I have no clue. I'm not there. But we don't have a uh, media these days that are willing to ask those questions and find out on the ground. Instead, we want to send 25 year old, 25 year olds out to interview people at the train station saying, how do you feel about being a refugee? You know, I, well, I don't here, think they did. I didn't think they found anybody who likes it, uh, but uh, they'll keep looking. My, my history teacher way back in high school <clears throat> used to say the biggest little word in the dictionary is if. If, 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 if. What would have happened, George, if when Putin requested to be part of NATO, NATO said yes. It would have completely destabilized China, which right now is doing great economically, doing great is the kind of the number two, maybe uh, one and a half superpower in this world. Giving China's Russia, come out of it's like. Yeah. You know, Visa and MasterCard uh, have pulled out of Russia and the SWIFT banking system have pulled out. And we're hearing about all these uh, sanctions and um, China has stepped in. China has now come on, um, on board with Russia to use its internal banking system and transfer system. So there was a hiccup uh, so that if you're using your Visa or MasterCard and you're still in Moscow, tough luck to you. It doesn't work. But you can now, if you're a Russian, use it because you're tied into an, an alternative uh, international financial structure. Um, just fascinating how this... One thing that I saw the other day, um, I like to read the Bloomberg uh, Newswire uh, because I still have illusions that I 
one day I may be able to play the stock market. Not like Kevin. Uh, oh, but, you know. I lost. <laughs> this last week has been oofta. <laughs> you know, two, well, little anecdote. To sure. get the down payment money, I sold my, one of, we, we have a number of cars, I sold a car. 2017 Nissan Altima with 75,000 miles. Too late, folks. It's already gone. Gone. Got almost fifteen thousand dollars for it, and I That's spent crazy. only eighteen. I bought it new at eighteen. The used car market is going bananas, mm -hmm. and I've you know people are telling me that you know their Ford F one fifties that they they're not getting more for it five years later than what they paid for it when they did it in the used car market. Well, friends, I can tell you, according to Bloomberg, it's going to get worse. The reason why is the chip shortage that we all know is the reason why Toyota and Ford can't deliver cars, it's going to get much worse. 80 to 90% of the neon gas, which is used in chip manufacturing to etch the chips, comes from, guess where? The Eastern Ukraine. Yeah. Guess where all that gas, the, the Russians are now pumping out of the earth, and are they sending it? Duh west uh, to uh, Dearborn, Michigan, to the Ford plants or the chip plants. No, they're selling it to the Chinese. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese internal, com internal consumption is China's uh, number one point. So what's, what does that mean for used car prices? They're going to continue to go up until an alternate way of manufacturing chips is found, or we reopen mines. We originally, the United States was the largest producer of neon gas, but we wanted other people to pollute the world. So we let the Ukrainians and the Russians do it. It's so crazy. Things, yeah. <laughs> now, how, how is this Anglican, you ask yourself? What has this got to do with God's plan for the world? Well, <laughs> Satan is a liar and he prowls around seeking to devour us. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, Satan is at work in the world. Yeah, and I don't want to come back in three weeks to say, oops, we were wrong. This is why we're taking a nice middle road here. Uh, on this story because the propaganda, the Pravda type stuff comes from both sides. And we learn through living through this pandemic the press is not on your side. The press does not care to be on your side. The press is on the press's side. And you know all these false stories, fake stories, and you guys know I don't like Trump. But Trump was the victim of so many fake stories um, that people were just making up. And uh, I just want you to know the press is not your friend. The press is not the friend of Putin, and the press is not the friend of the Ukraine. The press is the friend of whoever pays the most advertising dollars, and it will it will always be that way. George, what we what, how long have we spent on that story? Twenty seven minutes in Ukraine, but we're not even Ukrainian. Let's move over here to the next news story. Um, ooh, Justin Welby doesn't like white people. That's a fun story. <laughs> oh, my. There's a neat little article in The Spectator this morning by Robert Toombs, a retired professor of history at Cambridge. Uh, Justin Welby's been in the news because he's been uh, opining about the propriety of taking down memorials in English churches that uh, were put up by the families of men who made their money in the slave trade. Uh, or invested in the Royal Africa Company in the 16th, in the 17th century, things like that. And Justin Welby says it's you know J Justin Welby was criticized because there's a court case for an for an Oxford uh, Cambridge College that wants to remove the memorial to a man who gave several thousand pounds for 500 years ago to the college, and the college's students are get all, all PC. You know, oh, we can't have this because. It said he was one of the directors of the Royal Africa Company, so on and so forth. So Welby is very quick to beat up on Britain's past, beat up on these men. Uh, no, they're not going to return the money, but they'll take down the statues, chisel out the names. Well, the Spectator article pointed out that one of the most notorious slave traders and slave trader slavers and tyrants of the 19th century is being honored this week in St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Yes, and I had to write down the name. It's Oba <laughs> Ovan, Rama, Ovan Rumwen yeah. was the king of Benin. In 1897, the British led an ex 
sent an expedition into Benin to depose him and destroy his kingdom. It was a militant, violent kingdom that was founded on slavery, and it enslaved the people around the kingdom of Benin. If you ever watch science fiction and like the movie Dune, this guy was as bad as the Harkonnens. He was a real piece of work. But we're having a retrospective and a statue of him in St. Paul's Cathedral as a mark of our shame as white people for the, uh, you know, I'm not English. I have you know, my family left 500 years ago. I mean, but <laughs> you were the first one out of there. Yeah, yeah. Actually, we were, <laughs> but uh, we owed so many people money. We got to had to get out of town quick. Oh my! But but the fa the, the the point is that the, Robert Toombs, the Professor Toombs says the. Justin Welby doesn't have a problem with slavery. When when Arabs or Africans are engaged in slavery, that's innocuous. But when whites do it, that's morally repugnant. Mm -hmm. And he, as his observation is that Justin Welby has a problem with white people. He suffers from such intense white guilt, British guilt, guilt for basically uh, everything Britain did to create the modern world is bad in Justin Welby's eyes. Anglo-Saxon white guilt, absolutely. Yeah, no question about it. On to our next story. You, be, you, be, you being Norwegian don't have any. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> well, if you go back in history, you know, it was the Norwegians who started Russia. But we won't go that far back. Wow. Hell, yeah, a long time ago. All right, so let's go here and talk. Ooh. Bishop of Sheffield wants Christians imprisoned. That's a good story, good title. What's the story there, George? Uh, Pete Wilcox, uh, the newish bishop of Sheffield, he had been dean of Liverpool until about two, three years ago, yeah. sent out a letter to his clergy on February 22nd. Julian Mann had the sort of exclusive story, which he ran on Anglican Inc. And it's causing a bit of, uh, of fracas within the diocese, uh, getting questioning letters and this and that from the bishop's chaplain and whatnot. Long the short of it is, the General Center of the Church of England said conversion therapy, bad, no good. And the, the gay extremists and activists are trying to push the government to ban all uh, therapy that would seek to address a person's concerns over their sexual orientation. And the way the language of the law, proposed law, is worded is that if you pray for someone, you would be violating the law and be subject to imprisonment. And Pete Wilcox, Bishop of Sheffield, is basically saying, forget science. You know, this X, double X and XY chromosome business, nah, that's not real. Forget the Bible, you know, on uh, human sexuality. Let's, let's follow, you know, the popular... Uh, zeitgeist. Uh, popular <laughs> zeitgeist. And if you guys uh, do pray for somebody who wishes to be delivered, uh, then if you're arrested, it's, a, it's your problem, not mine. It's, so I'm very happy for you to go to jail. Well, in my experience, which is you know relatively only probably 35, 38 years as a Christian, people do get prayed for and are delivered from that type of lifestyle. Suppose you pray for them and are delivered. It's not just prison. You probably need to be executed because your prayer worked. I mean, uh, uh, Pete under... Wilcox believes uh, Pete Wilcox is not really a Christian as you and I understand it. A Christian. Oh, He's a bureaucrat who has a rather badly paid job as a bishop. Uh, he gets to dress up on occasions, but he gets to basically be the equivalent of my being on the county draft board, a local notable or worthy, but he's in England, not in deepest, darkest Florida. And by a lot, Wilcox's problem, as I see it, or actually my problem with Wilcox, I better be that, better be right, because I don't, Wilcox doesn't think he has a problem. No. But when you start chasing after the world for affirmation of what you believe God is saying and doing, if you abandon scripture, if you abandon the gifts of intelligence that God has given you to use just to follow the crowd, and if you're happy for your clergy to go to jail for praying for people, friends, I think you have no business being in the Christian ministry, let alone a bishop. 
or a citizen of England. Yeah, no, I. <laughs> however, however, we want to go down that line. Now, it's funny because we have a, another like story out of uh, Canada with the same type of thing, but uh, in the gender wars. And I thought we could talk about that too quick. Oh, the Anglican Journal of Canada has a story where they're preparing trial rights for same sex blessings. Yeah, 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 been there, done that. Episcopal Church has been there. And the Church of England has got clergy popping these things out every day. Well, the Anglican Journal reports that they've really been doing some deep thinking in Canada. Uh, mind you, this is the country that brought us Justin Trudeau and deep thinking. And they're basically saying that, you know, this whole notion that Adam was a man and Eve was a woman, that's really a cultural construct. God really didn't create them male and female, he created them. That's not true. God created them as individuals who then go on to choose whether they be male, female, or any of the other queer questioning, this, that, and the other. Especially and the pluses. Therefore in our, yeah, and the pluses or the minuses, whatever. Um, and I guess you could say God created them, he created him male and she female mm -hmm. for one person. If they're transvestite, I don't know. Uh, I don't want to go down that road. Uh, oh, no, no, no. Well, but it, here, here's, you know, the, the complete destruction and slaughter and butchery of Genesis, of what we know as the creation story, of what we know through science, what we know through reason, what we know through all the muses throughout time, is that we are too distinct, male and female, always have been. Right now in culture, the new zeitgeist is to question your gender uh, and to, you know, it's been done very well here in America where the latest polls show that the Gen Z's, 30%, don't know if they're male or female or if they're attracted to uh, males or females. Wow. What, what, what okay, a when, loss of... Just, when when I go into years. the big city and go, when I go into a big city and go to a Starbucks, about thirty percent of the baristas, I asked myself, "Is that a man or is it a woman?" But that's diff that's a different yeah. problem. I had a friend um, of mine complain that uh, gaydar is over. Uh, all even you know, <laughs> men who are attracted <laughs> to women are, are just so feminized now that I can't tell. So it's uh, the, it's crazy. But the Anglican Church of Canada is seeking to dismantle the whole understanding of Christian anthropology. What is what is man? Uh, who are we? What are we? How did God make us? All of that is being sacrificed on the altar of the most progressive and vicious ideology out there. The uh, progressive uh, transgenderism, homos uh, it, it's really transgenderism issue. Mm -hmm. um, and the Anglican Church of Canada is okay with that. It's okay with that. Mm -hmm. You're going to take a few Christians with them, but hey, no big deal. Uh, we have a couple good news stories that we can report here. Uh, and we're going to start with acronyms. The TAC and the APA have decided to share communion and sign a concord that they're going to start getting along. And this is really good news. For a long, long time in uh, Anglicanism, we've had fractures and schisms and stuff. Oh, did I get something wrong? You, you have a question in your face? No, I'm the Tactical Air Command and the American Psychological Association. That's the they're, one. They're yeah, merged. To, what, what's happening, Kevin? Yeah, they're going to play baseball together. No, uh, they've decided to sign a concord, and I thought we could talk about that, George. Traditional Anglican Communion in the Anglican Province of America have signed a concord out of full sacramental communion, which is wonderful news. Um, yeah. the, the unkind joke is that the continuing exists, continuing churches exist to gather all the cranky people who want to fight with each other. And the sad history of continuing churches has been further and further and further schisms and schisms. Mm -hmm. We've got leaders now in the APA and the TAC and among some of the other continuing churches who are looking at the big picture, putting aside past historical and personal hurts and angers and seeking to build, build God's kingdom and strengthen his church. Yeah. So. We don't really do that many continuing church stories, but I think it's wonderful that when we have one, it's one such of good news, reflecting the maturity and the integrity of the leaders of these churches. And it gives me hope. You know, I've met some of the cranks within uh, these organizations over time, and I'm like, what are you fighting for? You know, pride 
And but now to see them coming back and, and looking toward the bigger picture, it gives me a lot of hope, George. Last story that, that we had to wait on this story uh, to get confirmation, but uh, this is a, a trucker in Canada story. The, the truckers who want COVID freedom and not wearing masks and don't want to be vaccinated when they cross borders uh, caused a bit of uh, uh, trouble for Justin Trudeau in Canada over the last month. And it was reported to us that the Anglican churches, the ANIC churches in Canada, weren't going to open their doors to them. I was like, well, that's not possible. We better really check into this. And so we sent out some emails. We got some confirmations. Uh, what's the story, especially around auto, while that we get, we heard back, George? Well, I'm disappointed to say that there's nothing to see here, folks. <laughs> Keep moving. <laughs> oh my! I wanted to I wanted to rubberneck this you know, multi car accident on the highway, and well, we had received a number of uh, comments and posts and emails from people saying you really need to look into annex actions annex, okay. during the during the. Uh, confrontation between Justin Trudeau and the Liberal government and the Freedom Coalition, you know, epitomized by the truckers. Where is the church? And so we contacted them. And then the the deeper issue was, why was the Anic congregation downtown, near Parliament, near the government, how come it shut its doors to the truckers? That's why what we were, were hearing. they not out there the, the, welcome, the, welcoming arms? We heard that they well, won't let us in from the truckers. Well, I'm going to put my interpretation of what I was told. I'm mm -hmm. not reading to you word for word. Um, but rather, Anik came back and said, look, we're not taking anybody's side in this. We don't see our job as to push the uh, Liberal Party line or push the uh, truckers line. We pray mm -hmm. for everybody. We pray that for Canada and that we be united and that we can find a way of compromise and where mutual flourishing. I know that's a terrible phrase, it's been tainted, but where we can all work together. So no, we're not gonna get on a bandwagon and denounce Justin Trudeau as the fascist, nor are we going to get on a soapbox and denounce the truck drivers as fascists. I'll let the Anglican Church of Canada do that. Bishop Greenwood Lee, uh, Anna Greenwood Lee out in British Columbia, was having a wonderful time uh, parroting the uh, CBC and uh, Justin Trudeau line that the uh, truckers were all white supremacists, uh, Confederates, and neo Nazis. Hmm, a lot of Sikh neo Nazi uh, white yes. supremacists. <laughs> yeah. Well, At Anik wasn't going to play that game. And now, as to, and so that's sort of disappointing because it's, you know, and nothing really cool about it. It, it was a reasonable godly decision that they made which is understandable in light of the circumstances as to the actions of the congregation well the, the rector of that church said look ottawa has basically had us on lockdown before all this even began and we're downtown there's nobody downtown to open the church up. Mm -hmm. it's not that we locked people out we've been locked out as well we haven't had a normal church life because of covid and when us have to go into the city from suburbia to the church and the church and it's basically inaccessible to us the church really is not as an institution going to be able to play a role on one way or the other so no we're not locking out truckers in solidarity with the government no we're not opening our doors and doing feeding stations and heating stations however individuals in that congregation are doing all those things supporting the truckers some are part of the truckers movement mm -hmm. some think it's a terrible idea and are supporting the government but individuals acting on their christian principles at that congregation in ottawa are showing you know their understanding of christian social justice and activism in the world the institution of the church with the vestry and the diocese just decided that's not something we can do practically or theologically but our people are doing it and god bless them that's my interpretation of the reams I paper right yeah, that's very good all right george that's uh 44 minutes of and, and i have to say the only yeah. the only you, you notice the only person who is really happy about the russian invasion of ukraine hmm? 
Justin Trudeau. He's off <laughs> yes, he's the like, TV now. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> cares about him anymore. <laughs> He has now been replaced by uh, Vladimir Putin as the evil monster of the moment. <laughs> All right, well, George, uh, closing out the show here. This week I'm doing a, what, there you go. I'm doing surgery prep. I have to take all these eye drops and uh, stuff before I have my uh, cataract surgery on Thursday. So before you guys see me next, they will uh, fix my, my left eye. Uh, I'll show up here Friday. I'll have a little eye patch, I think, right there. Cool, George. I hope you get your more. It'll be the same one that same eye that Gavin, same eye that Gavin had. I mean, I which, it was. which eye did yeah, Gavin yeah. have? I don't the, remember. He had a retina, a torn retina in one of his eyes. That was pretty sad. All right, so keep me in your prayers, and you'll see me Friday. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode seven hundred twenty-two of Anglican Unscripted.